last weekend was powerful when Pastor Jeremy talked about perhaps God will heal me. It was an incredible service last Sunday. And we've been receiving reports that God, in fact, touched people and that people were healed. Uh, Pastor Jeremy, a young woman, told him this week that Sunday was the first night that she had ever had a full night's rest in a long, long time because we prayed for people to sleep. In fact, on Wednesday, when I met with one of the ladies from our church, I asked her, how are you feeling? Because she responded to, I've got this headache right there in the, in the front of my head that I've been struggling with for a long time. I checked with, in, with her on Wednesday. She hadn't had a headache since she'd been prayed for on Sunday morning. I checked with her again this morning. How have you been feeling? I still have not had a headache since I've been prayed for on Sunday morning. And so it's incredible. But this one, this one gets me a lot. We believe, right, that, that God moves through his word. And God's word is not limited to location. And so our online audience was able to hear the exact same message that we were hearing in this room last week. And we received this message. Last week's healing service topped the heavens and the powerful moving of the spirit generated through the airwaves. And I was healed from sleeping troubles. Praise the Lord and bless you, Avenue family. Like that's amazing. And so perhaps God, perhaps God, his word will go forth and it will accomplish what it is set forth to accomplish. And I'm so excited about that. Well, again, if it's your first time, we say welcome. My name is Pastor Lindsay, and together with my husband, Jeremy, we have the honor and privilege of leading Avenue Church. And today, I want to talk about this. Perhaps God will give me purpose. And the reason why I say this is because at the beginning of this series, we all received a perhaps God card. And we wrote down our prayers. Perhaps God will do this. Perhaps God will do that. But I really saw a common theme in these, in these cards as we prayed for them every single week. I saw a common theme of perhaps God will give me purpose. That many of us in this room were, are lacking, God, what do, you, what do you want to do with my life? And this is what I want to share today because I'm very passionate about this subject. Because when we have a lack of purpose, right, which really boils down to do I have a lack of meaning in my life? Like, what am I doing with my time? What, what am I doing with my life? Does, does any of this matter? Has anyone been there before? Because I've been there. And we start asking ourselves these questions. There could even be a feeling of unfulfillment or perhaps there is a feeling that there's got to be something more. There's got to be something more. Have you ever been there? God, what is my purpose? And the reason why I'm so passionate about this idea of purpose is because for years and years I was caught in a tension of is purpose what I do or is purpose who I am? It's a tension. It's a struggle. It's a frustration because this purpose really tied to who I am as a core human being, as Lindsay Bosma, or is it more about what I do? And I've been wrestling with this for years. So is purpose what I do or is it who I am? What is this right here, friends? What's this? Tell me what this is. You can say it. It's a spoon, right? In my house growing up, it was also a weapon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. New mamas, you probably don't do that, but my mama did. <laughs> I have run many miles around the house trying to avoid this bad boy right here. But what is the purpose of a spoon? And you can talk to me. Talk to me. Scoop, right? Stir, right? Not just swat. Stir and scoop, right? Um, to put things on plate. It could be whatever, right? But this has a purpose to it. See, purpose is the reason for which something exists is done, it's made, right? This has a handle, so it was designed to be held. And it's something, it's its purpose for its design. And so here's what I wanna show you this morning. Because I want us to look at the definition of purpose in a different light. I want us to look at it like this. Purpose is intentional design. Purpose is intentional design, meaning that there is a, a reason for it. There is a use for that. There is great intent into the way you and I were designed. You were created with intentional design. You were created with purpose. And so for today's message, I want these two things to be synonymous. Meaning that if I say intentional design, I want you to think purpose. And if I say the word purpose, I want you to think intentional design. Because God created us with intentional design. So purpose is intentional design. See, I am Lindsay. I am formed by God. And how do I know this? How do I believe this? Well, David wrote it so well in Psalm 139. He said, you formed my innermost being. And now hear me, if you know who David is, David was a shepherd boy. 
David was a shepherd boy who God chose to be the next king of Israel. So he is only the second king of Israel. In fact, David was so set aside, so really not even thought of by his family, that when the prophet came to anoint a king of Israel, David wasn't even in the room. David's father didn't even feel that it was necessary for David to be in the room because there's no way that David could have been chosen to be the next king of Israel. Because we have this idea that the framework is what matters to God. It's amazing that David went from being shepherd boy to being anointed the moment that he was proclaimed that he would be the next king of Israel. This was as a teenage boy. The moment that it was proclaimed that he would be the next king of Israel, it says the spirit of the Lord came strongly upon him. We know that as a shepherd, he he fought off bears and lions. He protected his sheep and his goats. But we also know that he defeated a giant, right? Where the spirit of the Lord is upon him, he was able to do great things. But I find it so interesting that David, instead of talking about the things that he did, he talks about his intentional design. And so when we really get into the heartbeat of who David is, his heartbeat was not necessarily connected to what he did, but who he was. And so I want to share this with you, and I want it to get into your system, because again, that tension, is my purpose about who I am, or is it about what I do? And so David said, you formed my innermost being, shaping my delicate inside and my intricate outside, and wove them all together in my mother's womb. I thank you, God, for making me so mysteriously complex. So ladies, if your husbands have ever called you complex, say thank you. It's in the Bible. Mysteriously complex, just like David, slaying giants, right? Everything you do is marvelously breathtaking, It simply amazes me to think about it, how thoroughly you know me, Lord. You even formed every bone in my body, and when you created me in the secret place, carefully, skillfully, think of these words that are being used. Carefully, skillfully, in intentional design, you created me in the secret place. You shaped me from nothing into something. You saw who you created me to be before I became me. Purpose is going to be a process, friends, when we talk about that. You saw me before you created me to be, before I became me. Before I'd ever seen the light of day, the number of days you planned for me were already recorded in your book. Can I tell you that purpose is about who you are? Purpose is about who you are. I am Lindsay. I am God's workmanship. I am fearfully and wonderfully made, sometimes more fearfully, but you never know. God is moving in me. Jesus made his home in my heart like his Holy Spirit dwells in my heart and in my life. I am Lindsay. But I also want to share with you Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. The Apostle Paul says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's a gift from God. So salvation is not because of what you've done. It's all because of what Jesus has done. And it's a gift to you. And it's not of your own doing, it's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. So we are his intentional design, created in Christ Jesus for good works, right? Whenever you see a word for, it means that is your intention. So I was saved, I was created for good works, for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk walk in them. What does that mean? Purpose is also about what you do. So that tension that we're living with, both of them apply to our godly purposes. That I am intentionally designed, and what I do is also intentionally designed. So I'm living in in both of those things mattering. It matters who I am, and it also matters what I do. And, And let me explain this, though. Because if we go back to that scripture It says it is for grace that you've been saved. It's not a result of works, right? But that you should walk in them. And so this is what we need to know. I don't work for purpose. I walk in purpose. Because this is where we, this is where the tension gets tricky. Because if we believe that we work for purpose, friends, you're always going to place what you do in front of who you are. And when you place what you do in front of who you are, you are always going to be needing to seek the approval of other people. And hear me, you're never going to be enough for them. I think that was the breaking point in my life in the struggle, like a good breaking point, right? 
It was more of a breakthrough, I should say, than a breaking point. I wrestled with that tension. Is purpose what I am or is it what I do for so long? Because I'm a doer. I loved Ephesians chapter 2 when God said that he's going to use me for good works because I enjoy doing good works. But the problem is that I was so focused on doing and not being that I put the action part of my purpose in front of the who I am, the intricately, the intimately made Lindsay. And so we cannot get these things out of order. We must prioritize them as we move forward in our purpose that, yes, it's about who I am and what I do, but who I am comes first. And who I am is I'm saved. I'm redeemed. Come on. I'm a child of God. And let me, let me explain this. God has prepared a path of good works for, your, for believers, which he will perform in and through them as they walk by faith. So who is doing the performing? It's God. God is going to perform in you and through you as you and I, as believers in Jesus, as we walk through faith. This does not mean doing a work for God. Instead, it is God performing his work in and through believers. And so I walk in purpose. I do not work for purpose. I walk in purpose. See, it's by grace that you and I have been saved. Grace is that God gave me what I did not deserve. We have to know the difference between these two things. Mercy is that I I didn't get what I deserved, right? Like, whoo, I should have been punished for that, right? Y'all should have gotten a spoon. And we didn't get the spoon. We got grace. Grace is getting something that I don't deserve. I didn't earn salvation. I didn't work to be used by God. God created in his intentional design that he would use people to build his kingdom. That wasn't my idea. That was God's idea, that he would enhance the kingdom of God. He would spread the gospel. He would share the good news, and that his Holy Spirit would move through people. It's intentional design. Because we are his workmanship, Because of who he purposed me to be, because of God's intentional design on my life, Jesus gets to live in and through me. Now, I want to share with you um, a couple of people in the Bible, because it's all great to hear that, okay, Linz, that's awesome, I've got purpose, but what does that look like, right? You're telling me that I am so intimately formed by this creative and intentional God, and that he's going to use me for greater things that I could ever think of for myself. But how? Like, what what would that look like in 2021? What does that look like in my life? Well, I want to go to Matthew chapter 4 because I want you to see what it looks like in the lives of people just like you and me. Because in the Bible, it is filled with men and women who are no different except for timelines other than you and I. They eat, breathe, and sleep just like we do. They struggle with frustrations and sin just like we do. They have marital problems, come on, just like we do. They have disruptive children, just like we do. They have sweet angel children, just like we do. Like, they have the same struggles that you and I have. And so I want to look at Matthew chapter 4. It says, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, now this is John the Baptist that he's speaking of. He left Judea and he returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth and then there he moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee. And it goes on to say this, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Now let's talk for a second, because we were just introduced to a couple of people. John the Baptist, let's talk about him for a moment. He was purposed before he was ever born, that he would prepare the way of the Lord. We can read Old Testament prophets that spoke to who John the Baptist would be, calling out from the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. In fact, his mother, who could not have children, an angel of the Lord spoke to her, told her that she was in fact going to carry a child, told her husband that she was going to carry a child, and she became pregnant with John the Baptist. The Lord chose his name. They didn't choose his name. The Lord chose his path. They did not choose his path. So John, the difference with John the Baptist, with his purpose, is he was born to do this. He was born to do this. From from the time it was even a thought in the Lord's mind, he was chosen. He was born to do this. But let's go back. It says that these guys, these, these disciples, right, who aren't yet disciples, but Simon, who's Peter, and Andrew, they're casting a net into the sea because they are fishermen. This is what they do for a living. This is what they do for their life. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 
immediately left, they left their nets and they followed them. So maybe you're in this room today and you don't feel like, I don't know what I was born. Like, really, I mean, have you ever seen someone who is maybe a star athlete or someone who has the voice of the most incredible voice you've ever heard and you're like, oh, they were born to do that. But then you look at somebody like me, you're like, was I born to do that? (laughs) Have you ever wondered that? Like, what was I born to do? And maybe we didn't have the, I was born to do this. But maybe we're more like the disciples where I was invited to do this. I was invited to do this. Because, friends, so many times we make purpose seem like it's this big thing that only certain people get to have. It's this this big, this big, important, almost um, exclusive calling or exclusive opportunity or exclusive birthright that only a few get to do. John the Baptist, yes, he was born to do this. Jesus, it was prophesied that he was born to do this. But the disciples, they were invited to do this. Can I tell you that this is my life story? A season, a season, or actually, let's say a series, not even a season, a series of invitations that people or Jesus have invited me to do this. It's an invitation. You and I have invitations to purpose. And this is what it looks like. If he he made them and said, I'll make you fishers of men, instead of being a fisher of fish, right? That's what they did for a living. They, They caught fish. And what I want you to see in this is that purpose is going to move what is familiar to what is eternal. And can you guys click on that slide for me real quick? Purpose moves what is familiar to eternal. He took what they did on a daily basis. Every day they got up, except for Shabbat, the Sabbath. Every day... They got up and they went and they casted their nets. And every day they worked together in unity to create an income for their family, to feed Capernaum, to feed people along the Sea of Galilee, to sell this fish and to make a living. But then they met Jesus. They have an encounter with God. And that invitation to come into a relationship with Christ, to follow him, took what was familiar, which was fishing, and made it eternal. What do you mean? He said, I want to make you fishers of men. So he took a concept of something that they would understand. Okay, sometimes we think that purpose is going to be so far from what I understand. God, are you going to uproot me from this so far to something that I have no idea of? He's going to use what is familiar and he's going to make it eternal. So what Jesus did with the disciples, they said, I want to make you fishers of men. Meaning I want to use you, use the skills that you already have, Use something that you know to do, but I want to change the perspective of it because now we're going to care about the souls of people. Now we're going to go fishing for souls. We're going to share the gospel. We're going to heal the sick. We're going to raise the dead. We're going to shake up the Pharisees. We're going to throw off religious restraints, and we are going to bring the kingdom of God to this earth. You're invited. Guys, that's what Jesus does to us. He says, you're invited. So if you've ever, and hear me, some of us got like PTSD from like, playgrounds in elementary school where it's like Red Rover, right? And you're like, is anyone going to pick me to be on their team? Anyone be the, have ever been the person who was not chosen, right? I've been there. We're on the side and we think, oh man, could I ever be invited to play in this game? Or maybe it's a team sport and man, we hate it when they choose two captains and the captains get to choose their team. Am I going to be sitting this one out? Am I the one that just gets to come on at the end because I have to, to keep the teams even? You're not a have to. You're an invitation. You are invited to be a part of purpose. See, what's incredible is that purpose moves my heart. I remember um, when I was in college, I worked at a 55-plus apartment building, and I was a leasing agent, so I would lease, you know, and sell apartments. And God had already saved my heart a year and a half before that. So I was so on fire for Jesus. Everybody knew I was a Christian, but it was so funny. My manager at the property coined me Sister Mary Agnes. I'm like, I'm not Catholic. Like, I'm I'm Christian. But because of my love for Jesus, what was familiar to her was Catholicism. So her giving me the nickname Sister Mary Agnes was really not so much a punch in my gut. It was more like a, good job, girl. We know you love Jesus. So on this property, I was not Lindsay. I was Sister Mary Agnes. But what was so amazing is that God had set me apart with purpose. 
And I knew that my purpose was to reach people, to share the love of Jesus wherever I was at, whether I was at a grocery store, whether it was in my family, or it was at this 55 plus apartment complex. And I remember the conversations that I would have with people. And I look back and I remember them so fondly because I prayed for countless people at that apartment complex. When individuals did not have families that lived nearby, I would sit in the chairs of their living room and listen to their stories for hours upon hours. When a person would get sick and did not have family or friends in town, I was the one who would do the hospital visits. I was not, I didn't know I was called to ministry at that time. I didn't have a pastor in front of my name. I was just Lindsay. Sister Mary Agnes, who loved Jesus and loved people, and I was taking the opportunities as invitations for my purpose. And I would take whatever I knew about Jesus, and I would share it with whoever was put in my path. Because hear me, purpose moves your heart. It gives it a deeper meaning. It says that, yes, what I'm doing and who I am matters. It doesn't just matter to me. It matters to the people around me, that God wants to use me. What we do today matters for eternity. We have to understand that, that our interactions with people, our private lives, our prayers, they matter for eternity. Now purpose, now here's a kicker, it will move you out of your comfort zone. I think Jesus is so kind in the beginning because he kind of lets you get comfortable, right? Like, let's get used to me and I'll get used to you, even though he already knows us, but he gives you that opportunity to get a little bit familiar. But once you get a little bit familiar, he's like, okay, time to take a couple big steps, right? Think about it's like a baby that has gone from the crawling to the standing, and now it's time for that bad boy to get walking. And Jesus is saying, your purpose needs to get walking and walking a little bit further and taking a little bit bigger of steps. And I want us to look at John the Baptist again and Peter because they're moving out of comfort zones. It says, meanwhile, disciples were in trouble. Now, let me, let me show this. John the Baptist, in this chapter, just a few verses before, had been executed. He, he was killed. And so if you're in this room and you're like, I want to be born for something, well, he also died. Like, like, take the invitation to purpose, friends. Take the invitation. Sorry, some of you got that, but some of you did not. You're like, oh, she's rude a little bit. I'm sorry. I apologize. But here you find the disciples that they're in trouble, far away from land. Jesus is not with them physically. For a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on water. And when the disciples saw him walking on water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once, do not be afraid. He said, take courage, I'm here. Then Peter called to him. Now hear me, I love Peter. Because Peter is mouthy. Peter is impulsive. Peter has no filter. Peter just says whatever is on Peter's mind. And he says, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you, walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. Sometimes purpose is going to call you and move you out of your comfort zone. And what, what you might say, well, what was the purpose of this? No, it was just him being with Jesus. It was that moving and living with God in your life is going to take you to higher heights and deeper depths. It's going to take you places further than you can ever imagine. And this was an opportunity for Peter to take a step outside of what was comfortable to him and to take a step towards Jesus. That's, this is huge for him. And so many of us focus on the fact that he fell in, right? But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. And we always focus on he sunk. But my God, people, he walked on water. Why do we forget that part? Do you understand that trial and error will be a part of your purpose journey? Your purpose, as it continues to grow and you go through a process, it will be both trial and error. There have been times in my life when the Lord has called me to pray for someone and I have prayed for them and God moved. And there's been times when God called me to pray for someone. I'm like, ooh, I'm uncomfortable. Or Lord, this is, this is really, really big in this area and they don't know me and I don't know what they're going to say. And I failed. I took a step back when I should have taken a step forward. And so if you've ever taken a step back when you should have taken a step forward, so did Peter. It's okay. And Jesus immediately reached out to him and grabbed him. God's always going to get you. 
He's always going to pull you back to him. You're never going to be punished for a lack of stepping back or a lack of stepping forward. And he grabbed him and he said, you have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? See, purpose is in Jesus. It's not just in ourselves. So if we truly believe that I am intentionally designed by God, he's not saying, why did you doubt yourself, Peter? He's saying, why did you doubt me? And a lot of times in our purpose, we have to have an honest evaluation with ourselves. Because too many times, you and I, as men and women, we bank on our strengths to get our purpose done. We bank on our talents, our personalities, our decisions, our moves that we're making in our family, our career choices. We bank on us. When Jesus is saying, when I call you to step into something, I'm calling you to lean on me, not doubt me. Not necessarily to lean on yourself, but to fully place your trust in me. And hear me, there's nothing mean about this. This is awesome. I mean, think about the pressure that that removes. So many of us were afraid to do something great because we, we can't even think about the pressure. Just thinking about what the cost of that would be. It rubs us the wrong way. It shrinks us back. It makes us step further and further backwards. But when Jesus says, I just need you to come to me, move in me, be in me, don't doubt me. Don't doubt me. See, I love using the disciple Peter when talking about purpose because without a shadow of a doubt, Peter had problems, <laughs> right? But that makes me feel good about me because just like Peter, I'm not perfect, but it was God's intentional design to choose to use me. It's God's intentional design to choose to use you for his purposes. God chose him. God chose him. He grafted him. If you read throughout the Gospels, Peter was so protective. It was in his nature to be protective. God used that. God will use whatever you bring to the table. He'll use it all. I want to finish with this. Matthew chapter 16. Yep. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, can you imagine that? It's like when someone puts you on the spot and they want to hear the truth, they're like, do I say it, right? But they replied to him, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Because friends, when it comes to even to your purpose, it doesn't matter what others say about you. What do you say? It doesn't matter what all the other boys say. What do you say? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. The son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church and all of the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you, Peter, the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. He said, Peter, you're blessed. Peter, you're a rock. Peter, that is how I intentionally designed you. And because you have connected You've connected to that intentional design. I'm going to use your strengths. I'm going to use your gifts. I'm going to use your talent, your passions, your personality, your weaknesses, your hangups. I'm going to use everything about you, Peter. And I'm going to build my church upon you because you're a rock. I'm going to give you purpose, Peter. And the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you ask on earth will be done in heaven. I want you to see this, friends, that purpose begins in my being and overflows in my doing. Before Jesus ever told Peter what he would do, that he's going to build the church on you, Peter. The gates of hell are not going to prevail against you, Peter. You're going to pray for whatever you want on earth, Peter. And whatever you pray for on earth, I'm going to do it in heaven, Peter. Before he ever told him what he was going to do, he told him, you are blessed. You're blessed. You're given wisdom doesn't come of your own. That's who you are. When it comes to purpose, it's an overflow of who I am in Jesus, not the other way around. And unfortunately, in a day and age like ours, where everybody is so focused on 
the outside of things, right? The production of things. God is so meticulous about your insides, about your heart, about the condition of your soul. Because he wants the work that he's put in you to come from a place of knowing him. Knowing him. You see, purpose is not only a matter of being and doing. It's what we are, but also it's becoming what we are not yet, but are called to be by God. So hear me, there's not even the tension of purpose, what I do and who I am, but purpose. I'm starting, but I'm not there yet. I'm working towards who Jesus wants me to be, but I haven't arrived. And hear me, Jesus is okay with that. And we need to be okay with that. That I am walking in my purpose towards my calling, saying yes to invitations. You are at a place where you are still becoming what God has called you to be. I'm still becoming what God has called me to be. Could you say that with me? I want to just say this, this line right here. I'm still becoming what God purposed me to be. We say that again. I am still becoming what God purposed me to be. One more time. I am still becoming what God purposed me to be. Friends, we are not in a microwave relationship with Jesus where we hit the button for two minutes and I've arrived. We are at a consistent walking out journey of walking out who I am in Christ and letting him overflow in purpose. I'd love to pray for you this morning um, before Pastor Jeremy takes over with water baptisms because I believe that this is freeing for people, that I'm not quite where I should be, Come on, but I'm on my way. I'm not yet where I want to be, but I'm on my way. But I don't want us to live another day waiting for the future to come and then maybe God will stir up his purposes. His purposes are in you. Connect your passions to his word. Connect your strengths to his spirit. Use the things that God has already placed in you, personality, all of it, and lay it at the feet of Jesus and say, how can I live out your word today? So dear Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful for who you are. I'm thankful, Lord Jesus, that you are committed to walking this life with us. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, you said that you've started a good work in us, and you're going to carry it out to completion to the day we meet you again. So I pray that every single man, every single woman, every single child in this place would know that they are intricately and intentionally designed by Jesus, and that Jesus wants to use us each and every single day to bring glory to him and to reach others. God, to, to live a life of purpose. So I am so grateful for what you're doing and what you will continue to do. In Jesus' name, come on. Amen and amen and amen.